first up to set the bar high, uh, let's give a very warm welcome, please, to our keynote speaker, Marco Buti. He is, of course, Chief of Staff of the Commissioner for the Economy at the European Commission. And he's going to present, I hope that's what you're going to present, the main elements of the Commission's proposal. Let's see. But the floor is yours, sir. Please come and knock me off this lectern. You can give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina. Thanks, Eva. Um, new era for e European economic governance. Uh, I think a um, very good topic, and I hope uh, we can indeed uh, enter into this new uh, era uh, together. What I'm going to do uh, now is, um, I mean, to set the scene first. I think you both of you, okay, but Katrina, you mentioned the perma crisis, uh, Adam II's poly crisis, etc. So. I mean, to what extent uh, the new economic governance, the proposals of the Commission help address those issues besides setting a, a, you know, a credible frame for coordination of economic uh, policies in the, in the EU, I mean, in the longer term. So, um, challenges for 2023, um, essentially four that you can, uh, that I have uh, tried to summarize in this uh, uh, slide. You may agree these are the right ones uh, or the only ones, or maybe there are many more, but certainly I think these, uh, they come to the fore quite uh, uh, in a quite staggering uh, manner. Okay, first of all, stagflation risks. Second, uh, the risk of fragmentation of uh, financial markets. Third challenge is delivering the twin transition in the context uh, of uh, uh, the current uh, uh, energy crisis. And finally, the fourth one that has come to the fore indeed uh, quite prominently is the issue of competitiveness to the response to the Inflation Reduction Act of the US, which, by the way, in terms of uh, you know, triggering a coordinated response uh, is probably the most uh, relevant uh, uh, of the four challenges right now in the immediate. Uh, and it will be uh, part of the discussion certainly at the European Council in February and then uh, and then in March. What is relevant here, beside the list of the uh, challenges, is that the trade-offs are back and that back with a ven with vengeance. I mean, if you go back um, beginning of 2020, uh, when we were hit by the pandemic crisis, it was hard politically to find uh, a common way forward but it was not hard economically. I mean, actually, it was pretty banal from the economic viewpoint. What we had to do there, you remember, we had, okay, shock of the pandemic, lockdowns. It was clear that there was a collapse in economic activity, so we had to sustain growth uh, and demand uh, at the time. Second, uh, we had entered the pandemic crisis with, with uh, actually very low inflation rates, so well below the 2% of the ECB. And third, uh, the risk of financial fragmentation was actually addressed by uh, you know, loosening monetary policy and uh, you know, QE, uh, the PEP, uh, et cetera. So actually we lived at that particular moment in a world of no trade-offs. Now, I'm actually pushing my luck a bit on this, but, but you know, by and large, this was the situation. Move forward from uh, spring 2020 to today, and you will see, you can see here, I'm not going to, um, uh, to elaborate on all this, but basically for each challenge, you have to face trade-offs. And trade-offs implies you know, to have to make choices between uh, two objectives. And I have not uh, here made the links, but you have trade-offs also between the various challenges, not, on, not only within. So it is now, objectively, it is hard to, de to design the right policy, um, uh, policy orientation. Uh, and you can see, okay, stagflation more uh, clearly, uh, support economic activity and uh, you know taming inflation uh, on the financial fragmentation. We have entered the world of QT uh, uh, after the world of QE, uh, and they are avoiding fra financial fragmentation, the undue widening of spreads. 
uh, on delivering the twin transition, you have actually three uh, trade-offs uh, combining on fiscal sustainability, social objective, and environmental ob ob objectives. And on the competitiveness, the big discussion right now on uh, you know, what to do at the, at the national level, you know, state aid uh, versus what to do at the European level to avoid uh, the fragmentation of the, of the markets. Now, it's not the object of the discussion here, but uh, all these trade-offs bite in the short term, but if we make the right choices, they do not bite in the uh, longer, in the medium to long term. Actually, you have to address both corners or the various corners in order to find the right uh, policy response. Question, how does the economic governance review help lessen these trade-offs? And here, uh, hopefully you can read it. It's a, the yellow is a little bit uh, pale, but uh, it's not too, too uh, difficult. Uh, you have seen here, I put uh, at the, each corner of the, um, uh, of the rectangle here, the, uh, the four challenges, stagflation, financial fragmentation, delivering twin transition, and competitiveness challenge response to the IRA. And you can see, and I put the economic governance review in the middle with arrows actually bre uh, breaching to the various objectives. And you can see there, I'm not going to elaborate uh, uh, at length, uh, how uh, uh, getting it right on the economic governance review, finding, consensus uh, to move forward uh, together would help to stem the, um, these trade-offs and address those challenges. On the stagflation, um, prudent, uh, 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 prudent fiscal stance, I think the help on supply side reforms, which also help lessen uh, the inflationary you know, bottlenecks. On the financial fragmentation, I think here the um, uh, the issue of cohesion, uh, confidence effects are very important. Actually, if you go back again to um, uh, spring 2020 with next generation uh, EU, the stabilization and the confidence effect actually came from the fact that we found a cohesive way, uh, you know, way forward. Markets actually delivered uh, a stabilize, we delivered a stabilizing message to market, which was very effective well before any single euro was actually disbursed on the next generation EU. It took another year to, uh, through accelerated procedures, we know that uh, you know, it's a boat, the EU that moves uh, at, a, at its own speed um, before uh, we disburse any single euro. But the, the message to the markets that we are in together and there is a pilot, collective pilot in the plane, I think was very important. And then on the twin transition, the issue here is to, uh, is to actually foster uh, investment uh, reforms, which would help to uh, redirect uh, uh, resources, uh, private and, and public towards the twin transition. And finally, on the issue of competitiveness here, the um, uh, flexibility on the investment side, reform incentives help uh, on that front. And financial fragmentation, I didn't mention it, but the uh, a gradual reduction of public debt would actually help reassure uh, the market. So if we get it right uh, on the economic governance review, you see that you know, uh, we can have a, a, a virtuous cycle uh, which would allow to tackle these uh, various challenges uh, in front of us already in the very short term and lessen the trade-offs I have mentioned before. So this is the scene setting, the current fiscal framework, uh, and the problems. I think the, uh, I focus in particular on the fiscal side. Uh, I know Agnes uh, will talk about the microeconomic imbalances uh, uh, procedure, but in the, um, in the various arrows that you have seen in the previous, uh, in the previous slide, behind that, those arrows, yes, there are the fiscal reform, fiscal rules, but also the implementation of the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, procedure in particular as far as the reforms are concerned. So there is now we have a preventive arm, we have a corrective arm. You can look there what uh, the main elements uh, are. What are the problems that we have been facing? Essentially, six. Uh, first, complexity, a multiplicity of indicators, and which lead to um, in um, indicators arbitrage. So member states. Uh, 
coming up with the, with the indicators and put, put in the focus on what suits them best. Hmm? Second, uh, the 120th rule on the debt, uh, on the debt reduction, on the debt algorithm. Uh, and here I have to say, I plead guilty in advance because I'm, uh, I was one of those uh, at the origin of the, of the numbers. Uh, uh, it has proven uh, not uh, feasible. Uh, this is, uh, you have to reduce by 120 in average every year from the, your level of debt to the 60%. So that is unrealistic pace. Third element is a pro-cyclical bias, both in uh, um, good times and in bad times. So largest in good times, and then having to uh, restrict in bad times. This is the law of human nature. So, I mean, it's very difficult to correct it by uh, uh, European regulation that you know, we usually misbehave in, in, uh, in good times, not even personal life. Huh? Uh, but, you know, somehow the, uh, the, the rules should help to, you know, uh, at least partly correct this inner uh, bias. Limited incentives for reform and investment. We have a reform uh, clause and investment clause, but objectively they are not particularly, they don't have particular traction. Lack of ownership at the national level, which implies that rules are seen essentially as, you know, Brussels based, you know, they are parachuted in the member states and not, uh, uh, doing the right, uh, you know, being owned uh, by the, poli the uh, po uh, poli uh, political system, but also the uh, public at large. And finally, which is a bit the result of all this, is a, la a, law, enforce a law enforcement of member states, uh, oh, sorry, of uh, law enforcement of the rules. Member states never met, most of them or half never met the, the medium term objectives. We never launched uh, the debt-based uh, uh, EDP. So we have to correct these problems, or at least move towards that correction. How do we do that? Here is the suggested framework that we that we have. First of all, I put the emphasis before on national ownership, um, and here is how we would improve that. Um, we would empower the uh, member states to come forward with their own uh, medium term fiscal structural uh, plans. However, based on, on some reference path that, uh, that is designed in Brussels to see, you know, so that they, they, um, these uh, uh, medium term fiscal structural plans actually respond to common principles, clear common principles. This is medium term. Then they have the annual budget that commit to follow the trajectory that has been uh, that has been uh, uh, this, uh, decided um, for uh, over the uh, horizon of the of the plan. Um, member states can uh, uh, request longer adjustment periods, so it is the normal plan would be four years up to seven years, so to have a more gradual uh, adjustment, more gradual path of debt reduction provided that this goes hand in hand with the right uh, allocation of resources towards more investment, so better quality of public finances and reform and, and structural reforms responding to the um, uh, country specific recommendations uh, within the European semester and to policy, big EU policy priorities. Council endorsed the plans and then we consider also the, a stronger role for national uh, independent fiscal council. So this, uh, let's say, chapter on more natural ownership of a simplification of the rules focus on fiscal risks. So net expenditure path rather than this multiplicity of, uh, of indicators, um, put more emphasis on where the problems are, more grave, uh, so on, uh, on the, essentially on the debt uh, side. Um, and the and we do away with a number of indicators which are currently uh, part of the system, uh, which would no longer uh, apply. So a pretty substantial simplification of the um, uh, of the rules. And then this goes the stronger ownership first column, simplification second column goes hand in hand with stronger enforcement. So this is the. Uh, the idea, we are not going to change uh, 
essentially the, de the deficit-based uh, EDP, actually the 3% uh, uh, of the treaty, which is there and one cannot uh, actually do uh, away with that in the, current, in the current circumstances, but also it has had an important magnetic power and visibility. Ask when we go out here, the first person you meet in the street, what do you know about the, the European fiscal framework? Maybe they think you are a bit nuts, but okay, if you overcome the first impression, uh, they will tell you the 3%. Mm -hmm. And when, you, when we had discussed about with Mercosur, the idea of having a, a currency union in Latin America, they want to borrow that, they'll say, what, the 3%. You know, that's even with China some years ago. So this is not going to go uh, away. Um, but we are going to have a, a debt-based EDP, which is operationalized, strengthened, and uh, and clearly um, we uh, it is going to be in our in our uh, appro approach more credible. Um, basically, what you have is that the Commission proposes uh, once you have once the country has presented the fiscal structure plan a certain path for uh, expenditure. The council adopts that, and then the country, uh, the country implements implement, implements this. So the, here, the idea is that you should stick to your commitments. More ownership means more responsibility. So you stick to your commitments, uh, and then if you deviate from those commitments, unless it is done for good, benign reasons, because of a shock, uh, because of uh, external circumstances not under the control of the uh, of the country, you should uh, you should actually uh, deliver that. If not, we would you would enter the corrective uh, the corrective arm. So this is a bit the uh, we add also a new tool uh, to make sure that if we have lengthened the adjustment from four to seven years in exchange for investment and reforms, we control that the investment reforms are actually delivered. And this is a tool for that. Okay, we finish we finish with one more curiosity oriented slide, which is one uh, uh, that I have here. Um, in economics, there are many trilemmas. I, I'm uh, also a bit responsible for having, uh, you know, created some of them. Um, I mean, you have the hard economic uh, trilemmas like the one on Mandel Fleming uh, at the base of uh, uh, economic and monetary. You know, this is a more evocative one, you know? So clearly it's not as, uh, robust as uh, and, uh, uh, implacable as uh, uh, others that we have, uh, we have seen. By the way, even the one of, of Mandela has been called into question uh, empirically, but let, let's put that aside. So basically you have a trilemma here uh, which says that uh, uh, it is difficult to have at the same time three objectives, which is one step up, foster investment reform for sustainable growth, ensure a very rapid uh, public debt reduction, and ensure also strong national ownership, and at the end of the day, you know, domestic political stability. Combine two of the three corners, but you cannot deliver the third, the third one. So there are different ways of getting out the trilemma, and I, my uh, time is off, so I give you only the one that is uh, the preferred uh, uh, and in line with the, uh, the uh, proposal of the, of the commission, which is uh, we should combine in incentives for investment reforms for sustainable growth, delivering that twin transition that I mentioned uh, uh, before, in ensure national ownership and political stability. But this would imply that we have to accept uh, a more gradual but credible public debt reduction. So you see, Solution C is my preferred one. Uh, okay, this trilemma here attributed to me, not to the European Commission, because uh, because I, um, you know that is um, the name of the game. Thank you.